You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. That music can mean only one thing. It is time once again for the Crypto Rundown. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network, bringing you something a little bit different today. After all, today is a holiday. Not a heck of a lot slinging over there on the crypto markets, but rather than not bringing you a show, we thought we'd do something a little bit different, bring you a special edition of the old Crypto Hot Seat Keep your ears warm on this cold holiday day here. So without further ado, let's roll out a special edition of the Crypto Hot Seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the The Crypto Crypto Hot Hot Seat. Seat. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the interview program here where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we hope so, The Options Insider Radio Network. If it's not exciting, we're not doing our jobs. So hopefully, hopefully it's exciting for you. Next up, we have another great guest to join us here on the network. He's an old friend, even though he hasn't been on. In a little bit, he is Matt Trudeau, the Chief Strategy Officer over there at ErisX. Matt, welcome back. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me back. Well, Matt, it's been a little while since we checked in with you guys at ErisX. I think your last appearance was back in May on our Crypto Rundown program. So obviously a lot has happened <laughs> in the crypto space. A lot has happened for you guys. But pretty much 2019 was a pretty busy year for you guys. So maybe let's start there. Give us an overview of all the different things you guys rolled out in 2019. You're right. 2019 was, in fact, uh, really a, a pretty big building year for us. So <clears throat> we came into the year off of a round of financing, closing out 2018. And, and really, we had a set of major priorities for 2000. Sorry, coming out of 2018, and we had a set of major priorities for 2019. So one was to launch our spot market, which we did in April, which I think was just shortly before I was on the program the last time. Uh, Another was to get our DCO license, which is the license that's required from the CFTC to operate a regulated clearinghouse. And we got that in August. And then we launched our futures market in December. So uh, alongside all of those three major accomplishments, we built out the team, raised a bit more money, and built out a technology stack. So we deployed a brand new custom in-house bespoke matching engine and clearinghouse technology. So people, funding, technology, and licenses were really the themes of 2019. 
decided to go the easy route, huh? Build your own matching engine, build out your own clearing. You couldn't do anything off the shelf uh, last year here, Matt? No, you know, we uh, we looked at some of the off-the-shelf technology, but really, when you look at the crypto markets, there are some unique characteristics, and some of the things that we're doing are fairly unique in that, for example, we're operating both a spot market and a futures market on the same technology stack, so the, the same matching engine infrastructure and the same clearinghouse infrastructure. And so there really wasn't anything off-the-shelf that let us do that and met all of our requirements, so we built it all ourselves. And obviously, the spot market has been in existence the longest, so let's start there. How are things evolving on the spot market, sir? They're going well. So the market's been up and, and running for a while. We're, you know, as we, we probably talked about a bit on the last program, we're an intermediary-friendly market. So a big part of our go-to-market strategy is to work with the intermediaries. That tends to be, uh, this is actually the 13th market now with the futures exchange I've been a part of launching. All of them have been intermediated markets, and those tend to take a little bit longer to bake. So compared to going direct to the consumer, which has really been the common practice in crypto, we're working with intermediaries, and that's just a little bit of a slower process to get the integrations done and to do everything required for them to provide access to their client base. And speaking of going through intermediaries, the futures market you mentioned, you kind of launched it in December, but right now people still can't trade on it, right? So do you have any any anticipated launch date for when your end user, your proverbial grandmother in Iowa who wants to buy a one lot of, of your futures, when they could do so? Really, the, the trading will begin in Q1. So we wanted to get the market up and running by the end of 2019. So that was an internal goal. And we had some, uh, some regulatory reasons that we, we needed to do that before the end of the year. So we accomplished that, uh, but for those that have operated in the financial, the more traditional markets, it's pretty common, and really I, I think it's, it almost might be safe to say that it's universal that coming into the end of the year for the month of December and maybe even starting a bit in November, there's a streetwide code freeze. <clears throat> so you're not going to see a lot of integrations happening coming into December and then January. So we made the decision to launch to have the market up and running before the end of the year. But now that we're starting to clear that code freeze, we'll be looking to work to get some of those integrations done starting this month and, and then progressing as the, year, as the year goes on. And walk us through some of the choices you guys decided to make in the contract size. Obviously, we've seen a lot of cash settled contracts. Seems like 2019 was the year where everyone started leaning towards a physically settled contracts. So, so why did you guys opt for that? And also, why this contract size of 0.1 Bitcoin? How'd you guys arrive on that? So the physical settlement we thought was an opportunity and a gap in the market. The financial settlement allows participants to get price exposure to the, uh, the underlying asset, but we wanted to create additional utility targeted at users more like traditional physically delivered futures products. So in the case of, for example, Bitcoin miners, where they actually have inventory that they need to offload, the physical delivery makes more sense and it allows participants who do actually want to take, if they're buying, if they do want to take physical delivery and own the asset, by doing it with a physically delivered futures contract, it lets them trade, execute, and settle and take physical delivery within a regulated framework. And what about the the 0.1 contract size? How did you guys arrive at that? You thought maybe the CME 5X coin was a little much and maybe the backed one-to-one you guys wanted to go on the fractional basis? Yeah, in the case of the size, we wanted to make the market available to and, and encourage participation from the broadest set of constituents, everyone from miners or, or others that are more on the institutional scale down to retail investors. And we thought that that contract made sense in terms of, uh, in, in terms of being the right size for the broadest participation. Are you surprised that a beefy contract like the CME coin, which is effectively a 5X coin, that especially when, when, when crypto and Bitcoin were starting to threaten into the mid-teens again, that was looking like a pretty expensive contract. Are you surprised that that has resonated so much with, with the marketplace here? I don't know that I would say surprised. Uh, you know, it's it, hard to know exactly who the users of the contract are, but if they're larger professional trading firms that are looking to hedge as they're making markets and, and trading uh, large size transactions is not necessarily a surprise. Now, Bact obviously has also jumped into the uh, physically delivered futures space. So their volume so far hasn't exactly been blowing the doors off the place yet. Has that given you any pause when you're launching yours out that uh, something like Bact hasn't really? I mean, they're doing decent volumes, like a few thousand contracts a day, or is maybe in your eyes, is that impressive volume? Uh, you know, I'd say I'll make the point again when you're building out a new marketplace that requires integration with intermediaries, 
in a more institutional type setting. There's just a lot more things that you need to consider that your customers need to consider. And so it's a bit of a slower build and a slower burn than going direct to the end retail investor. So in my experience with launching other markets, it you know it's hard to say whether they're ahead or behind where one might have expected, but it it doesn't feel like they're they're really like there's a disconnect with what you've seen for other traditional marketplaces in terms of the build process. So I, I, you know it's a, not a surprise there either, and you know any market that gets up and running with the licenses with the tech that's a huge accomplishment in and of itself. So as a starting point, you know we we're, our hats off to them for uh, for getting the market live. You know, it's interesting. Obviously, the name, our name at least, has options in it. So I think I'm legally obligated to ask you. I know it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. You haven't even launched the futures yet. But are there any plans in the distant weeds, maybe towards the end of 2020, of entering uh, the crypto options fray as well there, Matt? You know, we, I think we have a lot of really exciting and interesting opportunities in 2020. The focus right now is certainly building upon the foundation that we laid in 2019. So, uh, you know, the, the first half of the year will definitely be focused on building up that core futures market. And then we'll see how the, the year develops in terms of what other products we might introduce. Maybe you don't need to rush. CME had their much ballyhooed launch of Bitcoin options yesterday. I think they did a whopping 55 contracts out there, so which... Most of the day, it was, it was zero volume. People were hitting us up all day. What's going on? Where's the volume? Where's the volume? So at least so far, I backed similar story. They listed their options back in mid-December. And so far, the, I, think, I think to be charitable, the options volume has been somewhat low over there as well. So maybe if that's any indicator there, Matt, maybe you guys don't, don't need to rush into the options fray anytime soon. Uh, speaking of different frays, and a lot of people always hit us up on the crypto show in particular. They want to know uh, what's going on on the altcoin side of the fence. I think the last time we chatted, you, you had mentioned something about maybe looking at, at ETH or some of these other altcoin in the near future. Is that still the plan, maybe on the future side, to expand the offering beyond Bitcoin sometime in the near future? Absolutely. So we in the spot market, we trade Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and Ether. And our expectation and plan is to launch futures contracts on the underlying products that we trade on the spot market. So we started with the Bitcoin futures. There's some precedent for that. We're now looking at launching uh, Ether futures, but that is still an ongoing conversation with the CFTC. And you know, as that progresses, we'll look to uh, to launch futures contracts on all of those on all of those coins that we trade on the spot market. Uh, the old regulatory oversight. It's kind of uh, the beginning and end of every conversation, it seems like, in the crypto space these days. You guys obviously got your physically settled contracts approved this year. So that's that's a, a feather in your cap. Last time we talked, we kind of chatted about the, the regulatory environment here in the U.S. for crypto, how it's a little a little stringent, a little tight, obviously, maybe compared to other other regulatory domains around the world. So what are you hearing, guys, anecdotally, as you're reaching out to the regulators? You obviously have had some products approved. Are you starting to see maybe a little bit of a loosening? They're becoming more receptive uh, to crypto products. What are you guys seeing as you're engaging with the regulators over there these days? I think it really, there's a, a couple different things converging. So over the last couple of years, the regulators have really come up the learning curve. They've invested a lot of time and energy in really understanding the market. At the same time, the market, I think, you know, those that didn't necessarily come from a capital markets background and then even those that have, have really done a lot to educate the regulators and then also really up the, the level on some of the technology, the operational policies and procedures, the staffing, so really professionalized. So I think between the regulators learning more and the players in the market becoming more professional, we're starting to see a bit of a, a consolidation there that's beneficial to the whole market. It also feels like globally the trend is more towards a regulated direction. And for those that started building from a regulated standpoint, had the background, had the experience, and sought to build a regulated market first, uh, you know, that trend is, is definitely coming in the direction of a market like ours. So you're not concerned then that the U.S. is maybe lagging behind a little bit when it comes to other spots like you know Singapore or Australia or parts of Europe where they seem to be a little bit more crypto friendly on the regulatory front? In fact, I think we're starting to see things trend more in the direction of what we're seeing in the U.S. So the U.S. regulators were a little bit maybe slower, more methodical. And I think in the long run, that may prove to be beneficial. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know that we're falling behind. That, that hasn't been a concern. Glad to hear it, because a lot of our guests coming on, again, the crypto show, have, have expressed those types of concerns. Glad to see you guys aren't coming across that there. Speaking of guests 
uh, on that program and indeed on the network over the course of the past year. I've lost track of how many of the guests in the crypto side of the space have been on the trading slash exchange, which are kind of synonymous <laughs> in the crypto space. It's definitely a very contentious, a very crowded side of, of the crypto space. I mean, we just had the BlockFi guys on not too long ago. They're crypto lenders. Even they're getting into the, the trading side of the space now. So it seems like there are more and more every day out there. What are your thoughts on just the amazingly crowded side of the space that you guys have found yourselves in? Is that a point of concern for you? You guys think your, your offering is substantially different enough that you could stand apart in those kind of bloody waters on the trading side of crypto? It's definitely interesting. There are quite a lot of exchanges. And for the spot exchanges... It feels like it's harder and harder to differentiate, and as the market uh, hasn't, you know, the growth has slowed a bit. It does seem like there's a lot of uh, a lot of increase in competition between the exchanges. I, you know, it's it's hard to say that we had um, that that we had the foresight here, but but I think we did, uh, and and part of the rationale for launching the futures market was to really create some differentiation. So where it's hard, where spot. Crypto is really commoditized at this point, so there are a lot of different exchanges trading the same thing, not very differentiated. We've got the exchange license, the clearinghouse license, and we can trade futures products that will trade only on our own market. And so in that way, we're differentiated. So even as the competition heats up, we feel like we're pretty well positioned with some really unique IP, some really unique products, and some really unique positioning. Now, one of the things I think that sets you guys apart from a lot of the other contenders that have come on our network over the course of the past year is, as you mentioned at the top of the show, strategic partners. You guys have a lot of strategic investors over there across a broad spectrum of the space. On the trading side, you have DRW. On the brokerage side, you have Team Meritrade. You have Susquehanna. You name them. There's someone, CME or CBC, Bo, a lot of different players are strategic investors in your firm, which, of course, gives you guys a leg up on some of these others. You mentioned you've continued to do rounds of funding over the course of this past year. Have you added to that already pretty impressive group of strategic investors here in 2019? We haven't, not from the, the last round that we announced uh, last year. No, so we haven't added new investors at this point. And the new funding, what is it going for? Is it just to continue developing things like the matching engine, the staffing up, or what, what is the new funding going for? Well, the funds that we raised in that last round were really to set us up to build out the tech stack, to hire the team, and to ensure that we had uh, enough capital to get the licenses that we needed and, and really get the platform in place. And one of the big names when you guys first rolled out, one of the big partners for you guys was TD Ameritrade. Obviously, they made some headlines of their own last year in their, in their deal now with Schwab. Uh, does that raise some concerns for you guys? Are you hearing a similar level of interest in crypto from Schwab? What are you guys seeing on that front? You know, it's, a, it's a huge development in the market uh, alongside the, the move to the zero commission. So you know, as, as far as our engagement, we continue to, uh, to work with all of our constituents and all of the strategic partners. And you know, we're, we're working to get them on and live and ready to trade. So no concerns that this TD deal will perhaps complicate things for you guys? You'd have to ask uh, TD as far as uh, what the specific implications are on their side, but so far the engagement still continues to be good there. And you mentioned you guys are, are going the intermediary route uh, on the crypto front. That, that's kind of a talking point we've had a lot over the course of the past year, those institutional intermediaries in particular. What their level of crypto interest really is at the beginning of the year, obviously when we were in the, in the depths of the crypto winter. We heard a lot of stories about perhaps maybe they were moving on. Then, of course, we saw the warm turning into Q1 and Q2 and more interest started coming in. And then we've seen price levels fluctuate and anecdotal stories of interest behind the scenes fluctuate as well. What are you guys hearing from the intermediaries you're talking to on the institutional side? Are they still as excited about Bitcoin and crypto now as they were perhaps in Q2 or Q3? What are you hearing behind the scenes? We're seeing, again, some good signs. So Fidelity getting their trust license. We're seeing, you know, the kinds of fundamental, it still feels like we're building out a bit of the infrastructure. So 2019 was very much a story about infrastructure, solving the custody problem, solving the exchange infrastructure and clearinghouse problem. So we're still seeing a lot of development on the infrastructure side, and, and really those are the, the bricks that need to be laid in order for the institutions to come in. So it feels like 2020 will hopefully be the year of building upon that foundation that was laid in 2019. Let's look ahead a little bit to that building year as we wrap up here, uh, Matt. You know, obviously, we touched on a lot of different moving parts over there in, uh, in RSX land, but maybe you want to leave our audience with a little bit of a hint a little bit of a tease of what they can expect from you guys in the coming months, sir. Now is the time. The floor is yours. 
Thanks. So in the, in the first half of the year, as I mentioned, we're going to be focused on really building out the spot and futures exchange and clearinghouse that we set up in 2019. We'll be looking at what other asset classes we might list, certainly looking to get some other futures contracts onto the market. And then in the second half of the year, you know, it's a pretty fast and dynamically evolving space. We have some other opportunities we might look at along the lines of setting up some borrowing and lending infrastructure uh, and potentially uh, looking to add leverage at some point. So those are some of the things that are on the horizon, Uh, not firmly set in stone yet, but some of the things that we're thinking about. Great. And Matt, if folks want to learn more, maybe they want to kick the tires for themselves, get ready for the impending launch of these futures and other products, or maybe they just want to learn more, where should they go? What should they do, Matt? They should go to www.erisx.com, and they can also check out our blog at the, uh, on Medium. Spelled just like it sounds, listeners, E-R-I-S-X.com. Well, Matt, thanks for coming on. We'd like to get these updates on all these different platforms you've checked in with over the course of the past year, and we look forward to seeing how all these different initiatives that we talked about here, how they unfold in the marketplace in the coming months. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.